Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, back by popular demand, my guest today is Ashley Madden. She has a brand new, amazing book out called Plant Based Delicious, and she's going to be making a recipe from the book, a one pot Tuscan pasta. Please welcome her back to the show. How have you been since the last time you were on? Hi, thank you for having me. The last time I was on was in 2020, I believe. Wow, so a long time. Happened. A lot has happened in the world since then. And I've been great. A lot of things have happened for me. I had a baby. I Congratulations. Still live in- Thank you. I still live in Taiwan. So I'm coming to you from Taiwan, from Taipei, Taiwan. Um, and yeah, and I wrote this book. So that I would say those are the, the highlights, baby and new book. Wow. They're both a little bit of a birthing process, if you will. They are. And I wrote the cookbook while I was pregnant and like did all the photography and those kinds of things when he was a newborn. So mm-hmm. it was both things happening at the same time. Can you show us the book? Because I haven't received my copy yet, but I'll, I'll be sure to post on it. This is it. This is my book baby, book baby number two. I believe when I was on the first time, I was talking to you about book baby number one, the plant-based cookbook. So this is my my book baby number two, Plant-Based Delicious. I just got my copy this week and I am so in love with it. So I'm really excited to share it with everybody. What is that beautiful recipe on the front? It almost looks like meatballs, maybe made out of beets or something. It is. It's uh, spaghetti and beet balls. Ah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I... I knew when I took this photo, I knew I was like, that's the cover shot. I knew that was the cover shot. So I'm going to lay this photo. That is so cool. I so admire, you know, I write books, but I, I, I have Hannah Kaminsky take my photos. I admire people that can do, you know, both the layout and the, and the recipes, of course. Tell us a little bit about the book and how many recipes, what kind of recipes, what can we look forward to? Well, the theme of the book, I know this sounds a bit redundant, but it really is flavorful, delicious meals. Originally, the idea was to recreate healthier versions of comfort food, and there are versions or remakes of classical comfort foods in there, like um, I don't know, like cheesecakes and ice cream cakes and stews and hash brown casserole and that kind of thing. But there's a lot of new ways of making comfort foods, um, or just foods that have a lot of flavor and texture. And don't feel like you're sacrificing anything. So it started off with this comfort food idea, but it really morphed into something else. And once I handed in my manuscript to my editor, we chatted about it and we were like, this is way beyond comfort food. This is just how to make plant-based vegan meals that are oil-free and gluten-free, super delicious, and um, kind of present them in a way that doesn't feel pedestrian. That's a little bit like upgraded. So that's kind of a long way of saying what the book is about. That's great because all your recipes are gluten-free. And, you know, I always did that too, Ashley, even even though I'm personally gluten-free myself. I did that before I was gluten-free because I just figured, you know, if somebody wanted to add gluten, they probably could. But so many people are gluten-free. But even if you're not, it always seems that you know at least a few people that are. So why not just make everything gluten-free? I love that. That That's how I feel. I was gluten-free for, I think, eight years and I'm not anymore. I eat gluten now, but I mostly, almost all of my recipes are just naturally gluten-free. That, that's how I cook. I think the exception might be if we go out, but I usually use like gluten-free pasta and uh, we don't really have anything in our house that has gluten, but there's so many people out there on the plant-based diet or on the path of a plant-based, plant-based diet. And I hate to exclude anybody who doesn't want to eat gluten. And for me, uh, removing gluten from recipes is quite easy, as I'm sure it is for you. Yeah, I mean, because really, it's really only in the grain or flour category, you know, I mean, I mean, I I guess, ostensibly, there are certain sauces, but things you buy commercially that could have gluten, but, but, you know, fruits, vegetables, legumes, nut seeds, they, they don't have any gluten. Exactly. Yeah, it's just a few of those grains. The, the way I remember it, somebody told me, is you think of your eyebrow, B-R-O-W, barley, rye, oat, wheat. But of course, there's other ones like spell, tricotali, couscous. Um, there's 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 a few more that people don't realize have gluten. That's great. I've never heard of that acronym. I like it. I'm yeah. going to use that. Yeah. But the thing about oats is oats don't have gluten inherently. It's usually because of where they're you know manufactured that they get cross-contaminated. But there's nothing yeah. glutinous about an oat. So yeah. Yeah, but 
years ago, it was so hard to find gluten-free oats where I, where I'm from anyways, uh, Newfoundland, Canada. It's not anymore now though. It's you can find gluten-free oats everywhere, which is awesome. But again, I know that a lot of people who are gluten-free or who are celiac, well, not a lot, but some can't have oats either, but that's True. a, that's, right. Yeah. So how does one go from Canada to Taiwan and what's the vegan scene like in Taiwan? If there is one, there is one, there is, it's amazing. It's uh, there's like lots of vegan restaurants. I have the places I regularly go to and they know me. Um, fresh produce is incredible here. The fruit is just, you know, it's so flavorful. I've never had fruit. Uh, that's like such good quality as it is here. And food is very seasonal here. So I had this conversation a lot with people who asked me about um, the food in Taiwan because it truly is, you know, you go to the supermarket and if kale is out of season, a lot you could probably you can't get kale, you know? So that's nice. And uh, it's good for me too, to also, even though I like to cook seasonally, it really does kind of force your hand into like, oh, okay, well, I'll use that now. I'll use eggplant now because that's in season. So it's been great. Um, we came here for my husband's work. Uh, we moved here in 2019 and we thought it would be just a couple of years, but uh, we're into our fifth year now and we really enjoy it here. Wow. Well, that's cool. I, I always think that's so interesting when I have people on the show that, that are from other countries. So you never really are. Have you been to the United States? Oh, my God. Yes. I went to culinary school in New York. I have some friends that live in California. Um, yeah, I've been in lots of places in the States. Chicago. Uh, I'm trying to think. Florida. But I think most of our travel has been, you know, Europe and Asia now. Wow. Did you go to the the Natural School of Gourmet Cookery? Yes, I did. Wow. What year did you go there? I have friends uh, that went there. In 2014. Okay. So that was before Darshna. Yeah. I hear it's a wonderful school. Yeah, it was before Darshna, but we have connected since. Yeah. I think she was right after me or right before me. Okay. Maybe right after. If I had it to do all over again, I, I might have. Yeah. I, I remember looking into that. I chose a different school because. At that time, you know, I was working a regular job and I couldn't get a leave of absence. That school was a little bit longer, but it sounded fabulous. It was fabulous. It's the best thing that I have ever done. And I left my career as a, I like left my job as a pharmacist to go and. Did, you were a pharmacist. Wow. That would have been something though. Plant-based pharmacist. You could have really uh, talked about that. Well, now, you know, it's like you're doing, now you're doing produce instead of pills. Essentially, I mean, so I was a pharmacist and then I studied holistic nutrition for a couple of years. And then when I finished that, I knew that I just was so in love with the connection between food and health. And so culinary school was the thing that I really wanted to do. So I just dropped everything and did it. And it was a really big commitment and it was scary at the time, but it was, it was the best thing. And I wish that school was still open. NGI. I didn't, National it, 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 I didn't realize it had closed because of the pandemic. No, I think it was purchased by ICE, perhaps. I don't think it's in where it was in Midtown Manhattan anymore. I think it's moved, but it was an amazing place. And it, the alumni there is incredible. The people who have, been, have graduated from there have done such amazing things. You know, you have Chloe Cosparelli, Dustin Harder. Like, you've had so many people who have been so successful since graduating from there. That's incredible. Cause I, I, am, I wish people, having gone to culinary school, would understand there is such a benefit, not, not that you have to go to culinary school, but when you see classes offered in person to take those rather than just taking online classes, which I know are good, but you, you know, there's, it's such a difference when you have the instructor there and they can look at it right there and then and taste it and tell you maybe how to improve it versus, you know, following somebody's video. True. I agree. Yeah. It's such a different, do you think I'm curious because, you know, I don't, I don't use oil either and you don't use oil, but I also go a step further and don't use sugar and salt. It would, do you think a culinary school would even be able to accommodate that? Because I mean, they rely so heavily on, you know, salt in culinary schools oh, in, in the restaurant world too. In the restaurant world, I think that would, it would be a very niche restaurant, I think to be oil-free and no salt. Um, but I can't comment on the salt part, but when I went to culinary school, I was straight up with all of the head chefs that I don't need oil. I didn't back then. And a lot of the time, you know, they would let me do things my way. They would let me, I think I say in my first book, like I would bake a quinoa croquette instead of fry it. And they would be like, okay, Ashley can do it that way. Let's see how it turns out. And a lot of the times it worked out really well. And it also helped me see how the benefits of oil and what it's really used for. That's really, a, you know, oil is a very common traditional ingredient in a lot of things. So it helped me learn, you know, that oil is used for usually 
a function. So I'm like, what's it being used here for? For mouthfeel, to provide provide moisture, to prevent sticking. So, you know, when you learn what it's used for, then you can start kind of working backwards and figuring out how to replace it. And that's what I love. I love that challenge because it's easy. I'm sure you know, because you have cookbooks, it's so easy to make something taste good by just adding salt and oil, of course. Yeah, sugar, fat, and salt. That's what Dr. Goldhammer said the day I met him. This is what we consider a good chef, somebody that can hyper-concentrate the flavors of sugar, fat, and salt. Well, that doesn't take any ingenuity to make food without it. That's a master chef, if you ask me. Right. So, I mean, it's really challenging. Like when I write a cookbook, um, you know, there's like cookie recipes in, or a cookie recipe in the dessert chapter that's made with beans. And I had to make that like over 20 times, you know, figuring out, okay, like what texture is going to be created by this ratio of protein to carbohydrates. So it really is something to not use any oil or cheese because you can throw cheese on anything and melt it too. And it'll also, you know, that's be- what they do. Yeah. When they, when something that I always said, the joke was in a restaurant, cause I didn't, I was a vegan pastry chef at a non-vegan restaurant when something didn't sell the special, you just put bacon and cheese on it and then they order it, you know? Oh, that's crazy. That's crazy. It's funny you mentioned you'd need a niche restaurant to have food without oil and salt. You know what they call that? A salad bar with, with no dressing. <laughs> That's how you do it. Oh, how did you know 10 years ago? Um, what te- what happened 10 years ago or whatever time you didn't use oil for you to choose personally not to have oil to know that? Well, so in in 2008, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I had I had been having symptoms since 2006, but I just didn't know it. So, anyways, I was I ended up being diagnosed in 2008, and uh, it took me a minute to accept it um, and to come to terms with what I guess the risk was in my life. You know, MS, like many autoimmune diseases, is very unpredictable. So when I came to a healthier place with it and felt like I was going to do everything I could to help prevent progression. I just started doing a lot of research and following a plant-based diet and limiting oil, limiting saturated fat, increasing the anti-inflammatory foods in my diet. All that stuff was so obvious that I just was like, okay, this is what I'm doing. And I just one morning woke up and that was it. That's what I was doing. Nice. Well, good. I love it. Yeah. And then the rest of this, you know, holistic, holistic nutrition, culinary school and then cookbooks because I want to help people learn how to cook without oil and without cheese and dairy and butter and processed ingredients. Cool. How many recipes in this book and what's the breakdown? Do you have desserts and entrees, things like that? This book has over, I think it's over 60 recipes. Um, Actually, it's funny. There's not, I was just noticed this today, which is wild. Um, the breakdown is, um, not that traditional really. So there's breakfast and brunch, which is a chapter. And then there's a chapter that's about my favorites, my favorite recipes that don't really belong in a particular category and ones that I make all the time. There is a gourmet chapter. So these are recipes that are still very easy, but I hear from a lot of people who, um, make my recipes who are on rise, shine, cook, sorry, rise, shine, cook.ca. That's my website. That's where you can find me. Um, And I've had a lot of requests, like, how do you have a plant-based dinner party? How can you make the dinner fancier? And I love easy recipes. I love sheet pan recipes, one pot recipes. But I put a gourmet chapter in here to show people that you can have really beautiful presented food that tastes delicious and kind of, you know, wows your guests. So there's that chapter. There's soups and stews. There's handhelds. There's casseroles. There's pastas or pastas. I'm from Newfoundland, so I say pasta, but sometimes (laughs) I thought. And then there's desserts and the dessert chapter is, I have to say, phenomenal. It's, um, these are the cookies that I was telling you about that are made from beans that I gave over like two months of my life to. They're very good. Ooh, that's a beautiful photo. Is that, is that date paste I see in the background? It is. It's dates. Yeah. Dates in the middle to make a cookie sandwich. So yeah. Um, and I mean, like I said to you before, the photography is a huge part of it for me so I really really enjoy that part of the creative process nice what do you, so yeah. you, you mentioned your website but I didn't quite uh, understand what the name of it was what what is the name of your website it's eyes shine cook.ca nice oh dot ca it sounded like dot ca like some fancy dot ca okay dot ca so, got it 
Okay. And then I'm Rise and Shine Cook on Instagram and on Facebook. And that's where you Great. We'll make sure all that's in the show notes. Yeah. So I love the idea of a one pot meal. That To me, that's like the beauty of having an instant pot because I love just these, what I call dump recipes where I literally don't have to cut anything up. And I'm, I'm curious how you're going to do that with your Tuscan pasta. Yeah, I'll get started. So the recipe is a one pot meal. It's takes about with chopping included, I would say like 30 to 40 minutes, depending on how familiar you are with the knife and how skilled you are in the kitchen, but it's a very easy recipe. And it's a Tuscan pasta. So we're working with some Italian herbs, uh, mushrooms, garlic, leeks, and kale. So the way the recipe is going to go is that we're first going to saute some leeks and garlic until the leeks have softened quite a bit. Then we're going to add in some mushrooms and spices and cook them a little bit more until the mushrooms start releasing their juices and they start to shrink in size. Then we're going to add in, and this is the kind of like the dump part. Then we're going to add in all the ingredients. We're going to put in diced tomatoes and tomato sauce and vegetable broth and the pasta and beans. And then we just leave it to cook. And then when it's done, you just stir in your greens and you're pretty much done. It's an easy weeknight meal. Do you don't have to cook the pasta first in this? No, the pasta is cooked in with everything else and the sauce is created by I've like never the- I've never heard that technique before. Oh, well, this is great. You're going to love this because this is a recipe that I created, I think right after I wrote my first cookbook and I was going to use it for a certain purpose and I just kept holding on to it and I was like, this needs to be in a book. So this is the recipe that I'm going to make. So, and I'll talk through the ingredients as I go and different techniques um, things that you're all, you're very familiar with, and I'm sure a lot of your viewers are as well. So the first thing that we're going to start with, and I'm just going to tip the camera down a little bit so you can see here. Oh, I see portobello mushrooms. Yes, this is our portobello. So right here we have leeks and garlic, and they're just going to go into the pot together right in the beginning. And we're going to saute these with water, like we just talked about, for about five minutes. So I'm going to get the water in there now. And so when I'm sauteing with water, I like to add a few tablespoons at a time. So like 30 to 45 milliliters. Um, And some people like to bring the pot up to a really high heat and just add little bits of water as they go, which is fine. I'm not that fussy. And I add a little bit in there, probably a little bit more. And then I just wait for it to come to a boil. And before it evaporates, I just add more in. I'm not sure what your approach is with with oil-free cooking. Are you, do you do it differently? I do just a hot pan, you know, I just put it in the hot pan. If I need a little water or broth, you know, I add it, but yeah, nothing fancy. Yep. Okay. So we're just going to wait for this to come to a boil. So that's going to take a couple of minutes. And so leeks, um, for anybody who isn't familiar, so leeks are part of the allium family or the onion family. So similar to onions and garlic. Um, I don't have any full ones here to show you, but when you're cutting a leek, um, you just use the light green parts and the white parts. And they're actually a little bit easier to cook with uh, onions, I think. They're a little less fussy and your eyes won't like water as much when you're cooking with them. Yep, so that's true. Is that a La Crusette pan? It is. Yep. It that, is. They probably, in, in culinary school, they probably taught, talked a lot about the best cookware, the best knives, I would imagine. So I learned so much about tools and cookware. Um, probably... My husband's like, okay, you need to stop. Uh, you need to stop buying stuff now because I, I just love Le Creuset is my favorite. I have a bunch of other ones too. I've stove um, in different brands, but um, in my personal and professional opinion, I think Le Creuset is the best, especially also if you're not cooking with oil. So I find the ceramic Le Creusets are really great um, for like nonstick as well. I really like those. And this is a. I think this might be a five quart Dutch oven, but you can also just use a soup pot. Anything that has more volume, like if you were making a soup, because you want to be able to add enough liquid so that you can submerge the pasta. So we're just gonna let that cook down for a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. And it smells, I don't know about you, but for me, like any recipe that starts with garlic and onions, it's just- that. Yeah, that, went, that is the hardest thing for me. No sugar, no oil, no salt, no problem. But when people say they can't have onions and garlic, especially onion, it's like, I don't know how to make it delicious because I've always believed that everything starts with an onion, every recipe. Yeah, I served someone once when I lived in, um, when I, I lived in the Netherlands for a couple of years <laughs> and I guest chef at a restaurant there a few weekends. 
Um, and it was a vegan restaurant, but I never really appreciated even how many people in the vegan realm also have, you know, dietary restrictions. Uh, we had someone come in and say, you know, I, I can't have any nuts. And that's like a tall order if you're making vegan food. So, and I, and again, I didn't cook with oil either. So the whole menu was oil free. Um, so anyway, so it can be a challenge, but yeah, I'm with you. An onion, an onion is a good place to start. Okay. So they are looking nice. They're softening. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add in the portobello mushroom. So this is about um, 10 ounces of portobello mushrooms, about four portobello mushrooms, and I've thinly sliced them. You can chop them if you like too, but I actually kind of like having bigger pieces in this pasta. That's cool. Are there any foods that are difficult to get on a plant-based diet in Taiwan, or are there any foods that you get that we might not get that are amazing? Yeah, so there are. Um, I often have to order in. I order some things from the state and have to get them shipped here, um, like arrowroot starch. Sometimes I have to go looking for that. Um, certain flours, like I get my buckwheat flour and my brown rice flour um, from the state. And I'm not saying that it's not here at all. It's just that it's a little bit harder for me to find it. Um, but for the most part, I, I can get a lot of things. There are certain, there's certain uh, different kinds of produce that are really difficult to find here. So for example, I was doing a recipe for another chef, the photography, and I had to have fennel. Um, and I couldn't find any fennel in Taipei. And then I found it in a specialty grocery store. And one bulb of fennel, one small bulb of fennel uh, was 30 US dollars. And I mean, it was like this big. That's um, crazy. Good. That is, crazy. That's a lot. It's so, Definitely not, not here. Yeah, here. So I, um, yeah, anyways, I didn't do that recipe. All said and done. So also when I'm adding in the mushrooms, I'm going to add in um, Italian herbs. So this is just uh, an Italian herb mix. Um, you can make your own. Essentially, it's a combination of thyme, um, basil, oregano, marjoram, and a little bit of sage. And I've also added in red pepper flakes. So I already buy this already mixed. Um, I think Simply Organics is the brand that I, so I'm just going to sprinkle that in there and give that a stir. So you can see that the mushrooms are already breaking down and shrinking a lot. So it looked like, it looked like a lot of mushrooms when they first went in here, but, um, they're going to shrink and release a lot of juices. So I'm going to let that go for a couple more minutes. And so if you don't have portobello mushrooms, you can use, um, button mushrooms, you can use cremini. Those are the main two that I would suggest using. I like um, portobello mushrooms for this recipe because I love like that robust flavor from portobello mushrooms and I like their meaty texture. You know, they're a bit thicker, they have a bit more of a bite. And also, and I mean, you probably cook with mushrooms a lot, but I think sometimes when people think about really healthy foods, we just think about like all the different colors, which is amazing. But mushrooms are insanely supportive for the immune system. So when you eat mushrooms, think antioxidants, fiber, B vitamins, potassium, mushrooms are so good for you. So anything that starts with mushrooms or onions is is a, a great a great start in the nutrition department. Okay, so those are you, 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 mushrooms, oh. this is what I hear, have to be cooked, right? You can't really eat them raw. That's at least what some of the doctors have said. What most of the recommendation is to not eat raw mushrooms. I have seen it, um, but you, I don't do it myself um, and I don't serve anybody raw mushrooms, but no, you should probably, you should cook your mushrooms. Right. Okay. So I'm just gonna show you what this looks like here now with everything cooked down. So the mushrooms have shrunk quite a bit. It smells absolutely delicious. We have our spices in there. And now is like the magical part. So now we are going to add in. So this is one can, one 15 ounce can of tomato sauce and one 15 ounce can of diced tomatoes just mixed together. So that's gonna go in there. And this is two and three quarter cups vegetable broth. It's just uh, separated a bit there. Um, yeah, two and three quarter cups, that's right. So you're just gonna pour that in. And then I'm going to bring this to a boil. 
So I'm gonna turn up the heat. Actually, I'm just gonna, I'll cover it. And so this liquid, we're gonna bring it to a boil and this is the liquid that we're gonna cook the pasta in. It's brilliant. And you get all those flavors then going through the noodles. It's amazing. That's so great. Nice. That is so cool. Yeah, so I'm just gonna cover that now. That'll come up maybe in a couple of minutes. So we'll just wait. And yeah, maybe I can, okay, so while we're doing that, let me just see what else we have to put in here afterwards. So we're gonna cook the pasta for 10 to 12 minutes, then we're gonna finish it with some nutritional yeast and kale. Do you use nutritional yeast a lot in your cooking? So I would like to, but I, I develop like, but I feel as a sensitivity to it. When I eat it, I just get terrible stomach pain and I wish somebody could make a replacement for its flavor. That's so interesting. And I, I've never heard that, but I mean, I, I definitely believe you. And I've heard of a lot of different people having different intolerances to different types of things. Um, but yeah, nutritional yeast. So tell me, so you don't use salt or sugar or you know, my food, my, <laughs> It sounds pretty austere, like my food would taste terrible. But uh, but I, I mean, I have it in the house and I make recipes with it. I And probably a sprinkle wouldn't kill me, but you know, a lot of recipes call for like a lot of it. Like I've seen recipes with a whole cup, like for just a very small amount of sauce. Yeah. So I don't know. I just, I think I rely on things like onion, garlic, fresh herbs. Um, and plus my, my, I'm, I got a pretty bland palate now for all the years of eating this way. Like I can enjoy just a, you know, a sweet potato and broccoli meal and I love it. I don't have to put stuff on it, but I do love my California balsamic vinegar. Have you heard of those? I would give them to you as a a guest on the show but he can't ship international i have seen you talk about it and give them away so tell me about that yeah he keeps coming up with new flavors like jalapeno lime i don't know i he, he boy he his business skyrocketed when he learned about the sos free world because he actually did stand up comedy with me and talked about now he understands why people like his vinegar so much if they're not eating sos uh, they're just delicious flavors like curry and teriyaki. And, and I find I don't need very much, just like a little drizzle. Cause you know, they are costly, but when you don't use like the whole bottle, it's not so bad. And you can marinate things in it like tofu or mushrooms or what else have I marinated in it? That cauliflower, uh, you know, just it's- yeah. Uh, is it like a concentrate or the yeah, so like a it's reduced. So traditional balsamic vinegar is about 6% acidity. So it's kind of yeah. watery. So basically it's just reduced. It's a good quality from Modena, Italy, aged 18 years, white or dark balsamic vinegar to which he infuses, you know, fresh herbs basically, or, or, or spices. That sounds amazing. Yeah, and people can do it. It's like not a secret. It's just that most of us don't want to, most of us are looking more for convenience. That's true. Um, I think that would that sounds like it's, it's quite a bit of work, but I would definitely be interested in using that because infusing flavors in uh, different kinds of liquids is such an easy way to flavor food. Like, um, for example, when I'm doing like, you know, when you're using fresh herbs and things like that, if you just like let them boil in the vegetable broth for a little while, then take them out, you still have that like essence. So I think that's a great idea. Yep. What is traditional Taiwan or, you know, Taiwanese food? I, I, you know, I don't think I've ever had it. So what is the hallmark of it? Well, um, I think there's, I don't really eat a lot of the local food because it's not very easy to eat vegan in, in the local food, but Buddhism is um, quite common here. And so there are a lot of vegetarian restaurants um, and they do a lot of vegetable dishes and a lot of greens. There's a lot of different greens, like a lot of bok choy, um, a lot of greens that you've probably never heard of. I hadn't until I moved here. So amaranth greens, sweet potato greens, um, a lot of different kinds of leafy green vegetables, which is amazing. But a lot of the places really drown everything in oil. Yeah. That's, um, it's so interesting. Yeah. And they don't understand why people might not prefer that, but you know. Yeah, and I think that another popular one, which I do have, is hot pot. Ah. I don't know what hot pot is. No, a hot pot. So it sounds, I think I've seen it. It's got liquid. It maybe has tofu, vegetables. It's like kind of stacked and steamed. Yeah, maybe. You make you cook your vegetables or your tofu or whatever it is that you're having in like a boiling broth, usually a vegetable broth. And that's, and you kind of share it. So that's, that's something here. And you can get vegan versions here. So that's really great. So we do that. Um, and there's a lot of rice. There's definitely a lot of rice I use in different types of foods. But Taipei is so international um, that when I think about local food, I mean, going out to eat here, there's everything. There's everything like there is in any major city. So there's a lot of variety. 
Nice. You know, I recently been exposed since moving to Northern California to Vietnamese food, and it's like my favorite now. I, I'm obsessed with pho. Yeah, it's so flavorful, right? Either you have like all the fresh herbs that they use and the broths, absolutely delicious. Absolutely. Delicious. And okay. you know what I do is I, I prefer not to use flour either. So I'm really nuts, right? No sugar, no oil, no salt, no flour. So the, the chef, he makes the noodles out of mushrooms. He actually came on the show a little while ago and he showed how to do it. He takes these giant king oyster mushrooms. They're about like, I don't know, this big. And he chills them and he takes this very sharp julienne peeler and they actually look and taste like they have the mouthfeel of a noodle. That's not, not of a mushroom. And then when you put them in the soup, you think you are eating, you know, noodles. It's crazy. And I'm getting yeah. my mushrooms because I'm not a big mushroom fan. But when I think I'm eating noodles, I don't know that I'm eating mushrooms. Heard of that. I mean, king oyster mushrooms, you can do so much with them. You can cook them like they're scallops. You can use them to make like a pulled pork type sandwich. I've done both of those things, but I've never used them to make noodles. So there you have it. Next book. Next book, oyster mushroom noodles. Yeah. Okay, so the broth is coming to a boil now. So I'm just going to show you. I'm going to put in the noodles and just give you an idea of how that. I have works. never seen, uh, you know, people cook pasta with anything in it at the same time. Ah, so this is really fun. So I have ten ounces of. So this is um, whole wheat linguine. I use this specifically because in the book I call for. Uh, brown rice spaghetti or brown rice linguine or quinoa. But I also say, if you're not gluten-free, this book is not difficult. You don't have to do any major changes. Wherever you would use like a gluten-containing pasta, you can do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to divide it in two because my hands are small and I can't crack both at the same time. So we're going to crack the noodles away from you in half. Put those in there. Going to do it with the other half. Does that make them cook faster when you break them up? It, well, it keeps them, if they were long, some of them would hang outside of the pot. So I want to submerge them in the liquid right away. So you'll see, I'm just going to, in the uh, directions for the recipe, I also say to make sure. So we're going to wait for the liquid to come back to a boil, but we're keeping the pasta submerged in the liquid so it cooks. So now the rest of the recipe is just cooking like you would make for or cooking, sorry, like the way you cook pasta. And I'm also going to add in one and a half cups of navy beans. Uh, in the recipe, I say you can use cannellini beans or borlotti beans, you know, just beans keeping in the Italian family. So I'm going to throw those in here. And Did I really like all the fine canned beans in Taiwan. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, they are imported, so it's not as easy, but um, actually for navy beans, this is a can that I use because, um, they're really hard to get here dry, like in Canada and, and, and the same in the U S I would imagine it's quite easy to get dried white beans, cannellini beans, and navy beans. But, um, I get all of my dried beans at the Indian stores here, the, the Indian food stores. So you can get, you know, every kind of doll, chickpeas, split peas, but, the like Northern white beans aren't very common. So for these, I, I do by canned. And so now that's brought back to a boil. And so I say to cook it uncovered and leave it for about 12 to 15 minutes. And I give the range because that really depends on the kind of pasta that you have. Some pastas cook a little bit, um, maybe around the 10 minute mark and some take up to 13 or 14 minutes, depending on the type. It's very versatile. You can use anything you want. So I'm gonna leave that um, in about 10 minutes when it starts to sputter. I might put the cover like on a, or partially cover it so that it's not splattering me. And actually what I might do, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna move it. I'm gonna move this pot over to my stove here so it's not in my face and steaming up the camera. So I'm gonna move this. Do you have a pressure cooker? I'm curious. I do. But that was, I, did they teach that at culinary school or that wasn't something that they were into? They teach that, they do, but I'm not going to lie. I don't use the pressure cooker very often. Yeah. I use it to cook beans from dried if I've forgotten to soak them and I don't make them on the stove. Um, sometimes I will use it like a slow cooker, like the Instapot, like I have an Instapot. I'll use it for overnight porridge to do steel cutouts. Um, but I don't use it very often for recipes. Do you use the pressure cooker often? Every day. I love right. it. It's so easy. What kind of recipes do you like to make? Oh, soups. You know, I throw in whole heads of cauliflower, whole sweet potatoes, onions after peeling, not cutting it up, 
put it in some liquid herbs, spices, push the button, take the immersion blender, done. That's how I roll, baby. So how do so without cutting any of the veggies, how long does it take if you use the actual pressure cooker function? Right. So I have the eight quart. This would be hard to do in the six quart, but I literally take like a two pound head of cauliflower. I use the green part. The green part is delicious and nutritious. Good. Two pound hand of yam. It's called cauliflower bisque. That I sometimes have to cut in half if it's real long just to fit. I take a sweet onion, I peel it, some garlic, broth, um, and my spices. And there's a bunch of different spices. I know there's smoked paprika and things like that. The liquid, and I do 10 or 12 minutes. And then I take my immersion blender, add a little non-dairy milk, and it's everybody's favorite soup. And I've been doing all my soups like that because I am I am actually quite lazy. It's not that I'm lazy, I'm busy. And it's if, if there's an easy way to do something, I'm going to do the easier way. You know, I think that's, that's pretty much human nature. Oh, I've never done that before. I've never put like whole heads or just whole onions or anything. And I, I would have thought to maybe try it like a slow cooker, but that would take forever. Take but the forever. pressure, mm -hmm. how long the pressure cooker? How long would that take to make that soup? Well, you know, it takes a few minutes, like, I don't know, it takes maybe 10 or 15 minutes to come up to pressure if your liquid's not hot. But then once it does, it's 10 or 12 minutes. You can do this technique, you know, this technique that I'm describing, I've done for 15 years on the stove for my nutrient rich black bean soup, which is in my book on process, where I would throw everything in a huge, huge stock pot with 12 cups of water or broth. And then it would take about 20, 30 minutes of boiling on the stove, but it's just quicker in the pressure cooker. And I love it. I, so I do use it at night. My husband eats greens every day for breakfast and we cook that in there as well. Um, I love doing corn on the cob in the pressure cooker because it takes like zero minutes. So I do I'm looking at it right now. Hello, pressure cooker. I have the eight quart and the three quart because I find the six quart, which is actually the most common size is it's. it's just I have the big, the yeah. eight quart. Yeah, yeah. I have the they have a 10 quart now, which if I had room, I'd probably get that. But the eight quart does well by me. And I really, I really love it. I can steam. Oh, artichokes. You know, when I used to, I learned how to cook artichokes when I was young, my mom would make them and I'd love them, but it would take like an hour on the stove and it takes seven minutes in the pressure cooker. And I can put four jumbo artichokes in this little steamer basket. So I find, I love the pressure cooker and I, I have the Instant Pot. There's other brands, of course, but definitely the electric one, not the stovetop one. Those are, I think, a pain in the butt to use. We learned about the stove ones in culinary school. We went old school. The, those are the ones that we use, but I have an Instant Pot. And it, it is, you know, there, it has so many functions. It's so versatile. It's so easy to take out and it's so easy to clean. Um, but where I'm in recipe development, I feel like it's one of those things where if I'm going to use, if some recipes are going to use Instapot and others aren't, I would rather make like a whole Instapot or a pressure cooker book, you know, but I'm very inspired by the things that you've done. I feel like I need to do that now. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, when you, you know, your kids one, wait till like um, the kids like three and running around, you're going to like, oh my God, I don't have time to cut an onion. Boom. Oh, I feel like he's uh, one year, eight months now and uh -oh. he is. That's great. Hey, so did you, did you have a plant-based pregnancy and uh, that was perfectly okay? Cause like, you know, some people, their doctors say, Oh no, it's too dangerous. No, I had a hundred percent plant-based pregnancy and he is a plant-based baby and we're a plant-based family. Um, yeah, I actually had no issues in my pregnancy. My doctor was very supportive. Um, I just made sure uh, that I was, you know, eating right and eating all the different food groups and eating enough protein, but it wasn't difficult and it wasn't I wasn't counting anything or, you know, there wasn't a lot of strategy involved. Um, it was really easy. And I had a really healthy pregnancy and he was a healthy weight when he came out. Um, and it's funny because for allergy reasons, um, and some people might not agree with this, but certain dietitians or physicians will suggest that you introduce certain foods to your children to, you know, make sure they're not allergic. So dairy or, you know, yogurt, dairy, milk, uh, fish, uh, different kinds of the eggs. Um, and so I've introduced those things to George, that's my son, um, but he won't eat any of it. He won't eat, any, he won't put any fish in his mouth. He won't eat any chicken. I didn't cook it. it was, I was with my parents. Uh, he won't eat any non-plant-based products. He won't, he hates eggs. So it's just really interesting. I'm just like, wow, okay. So maybe you'll change your mind when you get older. But at this point, he doesn't really enjoy anything that isn't plant-based at all. He's a huge hummus fan. Uh, he's hummus. Hummus. Oh, hummus. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's in our house. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I've I've heard research from some of the doctors on the show that that kids pretty much crave or want to eat what their parents eat, what the what the mother ate during pregnancy. Wow. Well, that would be spot on. Hummus is a regular in our home. We, you know, I I probably make a homemade hummus every other day, every other day. Between my husband and George, there's it's just like gone. It's everybody's snack. That's right. When um, I've when I've had people on doctors that deal with like food addiction, sugar addiction, the kids that are sugar addicted, generally their mothers did not have the greatest diet during the pregnancy and even before the pregnancy. Wow. And yeah, that's a you know, that's an interesting one because um George hasn't had sugar yet um, by choice, but I'm also not like really adamant about it. Like, it's just that we don't really have sugary things in the house. So I'm like, when am, when am I going to like rip the bandaid off? And like, you know, he hasn't had like a cookie or an ice cream or anything because we don't, I mean, he's had like banana ice cream, ice cream um, and different kinds of things that I make like, like bliss balls made of, you know, nuts and oats and things like that. But yeah, no sugar yet, but it's interesting. It's, and I think a lot more people, are actually doing that. I think there's a lot more people who are open to, um, or who aren't scared because I think, you know, um, maybe 10 years ago or so, we weren't really sure what it was to be a vegetarian or have a vegetarian baby. There was a lot of, oh, they have to eat meat. They have to eat eggs. Uh, they have to drink milk, but I think that's changing a lot. And there's a lot more resources out there now for parents as well. Yeah, and you know, when you think about it, like a baby that's born like addicted to alcohol or crack, you know, that's because, that's what the mother had. So why wouldn't it be the same with food? Yeah, I hope that he grows up also wanting to, you know, continue the whole plant-based thing that we've been doing. So I've been plant-based now for um, 12 years, I think. <laughs> I should know this. I get asked this question all the time. Whenever I do interviews or podcasts or anything for any of my books, we kind of go through my history and how I went from pharmacist to uh, plant-based chef. And I keep forgetting these like milestone dates because I, it, you know, I, I keep forgetting that, oh, another year's passed. So I have to add a year on. Um, but for me, it wasn't difficult to shift to a plant-based diet at all. I think that when your why is so, um, I guess, important to you, it's the motivation. For me, the motivation was so strong that I didn't really hesitate. I kind of just woke up one morning and I was like, this is what I'm doing for my health. Um, and I didn't find it very difficult, but I know that some people prefer a more gradual approach to um, shifting their diet. How did you go about that? Oh my God, it was four, 46 long years ago. I was a freshman at the University of Pennsylvania studying to be a veterinarian and stay, instead became a vegetarian when on the first day at my work study job for a veterinarian, I had to cut off the head of a live salamander and that was it. I just was an instant vegan. Yep. Her. But I wasn't very healthy at the beginning. You know, I was thinking if you write another book, it could be called From Pharmacy to Pharmacy, PH Pharmacy to FARM Pharmacy. That's a great idea. That's a really great idea. Actually. Yeah, you can have it. Just, you know, just, just give me in the little thank you note. I love coming up with like ideas. Okay. When you start the next book, I'll have to uh, connect with you and yeah. consult. Or it could just be a chapter. It could be a chapter, you know, from pharmacy to pharmacy. Yeah, there's a chapter in my first book called From Prescriptions to Plants, which is the same idea, but I love that. Yeah, or from pharma to farm, P-H-A-R-M-A to F-A-R-M, from pharma to farm. To uh, Mr. Calling, this is what you should do. You well, should it's be- funny that you said that because that's what I went to college for. I, I graduated as a speech communications major, but my minor was in marketing. And see, people don't really know who Chef AJ is. What I really wanted to be, well, really wanted to be an improvisational actor. But what I really wanted to be after that, if I had to get a regular job, was an advertising copywriter. And I have a book and everything. And um, I tried to get a job actually at Pittsburgh at this firm. And then, you know, you know, things happen that you don't expect. I ended up getting married, but I love, I love, I love create. I just like creating things, you know, writing things yeah. and stuff. Well, so much here and, and like with your cookbooks and with this platform, uh, you know, there is so much that you've created and that you've inspired with other people, but I totally resonate with you. I told this story. Um, I did an interview a few days ago and it doesn't come up very often, but when I was 19, <laughs> Um, and I was in my first year of college. I did not know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what degree I wanted to pursue. So I met with the um, the career counselor and we did all of these tests, personality tests, all these different things to figure out where my skills were and what interests I had and, and how they could go together. And then I'm called back to the counseling center and they go through all the results with me. And my number one fit was the culinary arts. 
And that's when I was 19. And I thought, oh my God, well, what am I going to do with that? Am I going to go become a chef? Am I going to work at a restaurant? And it just like blew my mind, even though I knew I loved that stuff. I just, I didn't consider it as an option, but then fast forward, you know, 11 years and I've left my job as a pharmacist and I end up in culinary school at 30. So yeah, that that's really interesting. Yeah. Okay. I think our pasta is almost done. It's so yeah, it's just you stir it every now and then to make sure I'm gonna bring it back over. I'm gonna bring it back over just to give you a little your refrigerator bacon. reminds me of mine, no handles, and you know, you pull it from the little bottom, right? It, it yeah. You're actually we're very lucky. This is a very big fridge um for us to have in Taiwan. A lot of their fridges are very, very tiny. Do you, do you, I, I always get fingerprints on mine. That's the only thing. Oh my God. Yes. You can probably see fingerprints on mine now, AJ. So I'm just going to show you this. It's almost done, but I'm just going to show you what it looks like as it's cooking. So you can see that like the liquid is reducing or has reduced a lot and the noodles are almost cooked. I'd say they're a minute or two away from al dente. So I'm going to put them back on. This is looking really good. It smells absolutely delicious. Okay, I'm gonna put that back on for a couple of minutes. And I don't know about you, but we are very much a uh, pasta or pasta family. Um, and in the book, there are several different um, pasta recipes. There's a pasta chapter. So I'm just gonna show you some of my favorites. What's your favorite dish, a pasta dish? Hmm. Well, now it's the pho, even though it's not technically a pasta dish, but that's, you know, it's, it's what I think of as a noodle, you know? This is, well, you must like vermicelli noodles. Well, yeah, the thinner, the better. I'm not, yeah, I would, I think oh. I'd rather have a thin pasta than it. And I like the alternative noodles, like, like we, like at Trader Joe's, you can get what looks like pasta made out of kohlrabi, you know? And I think that's fascinating. Yeah, and you can get it made out of different kinds of beans now, uh, lentils, chickpeas, um, green peas. We, we use all of them, and I use a lot of the different chapters as well. Okay. All right. This is done. I'm going to bring it back over. Okay, so we're almost at the end here. So as you can see, it's thickened a lot. Wow, that's so, beautiful. Right, and so there you go, your noodles, your pasta, the linguine is cooked in the sauce. So we're gonna finish it by adding three tablespoons of nutritional yeast. Yum. Yeah, and then we have some finely chopped kale. Ooh. That and then optional is some a one teaspoon of coconut sugar, and that's to balance the acidity of the tomatoes, but it is totally, totally optional. So if yep. you are adding added sugar, you definitely don't have to use that. I'm going to sprinkle it in here. Ooh, you know what I use to uh, balance the added sugar when I make my homemade marineras? I do either dates where I've blended them or a little bit of a, of a reduced balsamic vinegar. That's an excellent idea. I also love using balsamic in yep. my marinade as well. And yeah. so here you go. I'm going to get you a closer look to this. Here. Beautiful. Yeah. So that's it. I'm going to put some in a bowl. Now it's late here. I don't think we talked the time difference. So it's 11 yeah. p.m. for me. Oh Everybody my God. Well, thank you for doing this. I know it's so hard when people are in other countries. How easy or hard was it to get your husband to go on a plant-based diet? Or was he already plant-based when you met him? Um, nope. So he and I, um, well, I went plant-based first and he was so supportive and his whole approach was, I will eat whatever you cook at home, whatever you cook, I'm going to have to. So we never had two separate meals. We never thought about, you know, how are you going to deal with this while I'm not eating meat? And then maybe, um, four years ago, he just decided that he wanted to be plant-based all the time. So, when we were out. So now when we go out, he doesn't eat meat or cheese or eggs or anything anymore. Um, and he hadn't in our house for over 10 years as well. So I'm really lucky. My husband was super, super supportive and really easygoing when it comes to what he's going to have for dinner. And I just realized that I forgot it, forgot to add 
We also have to add a little um, red wine vinegar at the end as well. And that's just gonna brighten all the flavors. And I'm gonna plate this now. And it's a weird time for me to be eating, but it smells so delicious that I think- <laughs> I know. <laughs> Do people tell you you look like someone? <laughs> I was just asked this question this week. They do. I, I can see it, it's an act. It, she is an actress, and I'm trying to figure out: is it Michelle Pfeiffer? Who do you look like? Yes, is, Michelle Pfeiffer. My okay, husband so knows. it isn't just me. I, I'm, I'm looking at you this whole hour, and I'm like, she looks like a famous actress, you know. And that's who I thought it was. And you know, she's up to apparently. I think she's vegan. At least she went vegan at one. I point. think. Yeah, I'm not sure. If she's, I know that at some point she was. I saw that as well. But yes. Um, I get Michelle Pfeiffer. I also get the Olfen twins a lot. I don't know, oh. but I get that one a lot as well. But my husband has always told me that. Um, oh, fantastic. Lucky. So I'm going to plate this here now. So you can see you have the noodles and the tomatoes and the kale and the chunky um, portobello mushrooms. And uh, and that looks amazing. And again, one when you do a one pot meal, you know how many pots you have to clean up? One, just yep. one. And if you want, you can always add some um, almond parmesan or cashew parmesan. I like yeah. to make my own. Sure, um, I do the same thing. You know, I do mine out of oats just to lower the fat a little. But that's yeah, I've done that. I've done that once. Yeah, I love that idea. Um, I've also done it with sunflower seeds to accommodate people who are not free. Yeah, have nuts, right? Yeah. I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit on there. Oh, I just got a lot on there. Okay. Um, and that's it. It's done. Voila. Voila. And then, yeah, one pot, all done. And this stays or uh, keeps really well in the fridge um, overnight for a few days. Um, it's something that I make regularly. Um, it's funny, before I had a baby, I was very much like, yeah, one pot meals are great. Sheet pan recipes are great. And now I'm living it and I understand it on a whole new level. Like, oh, I need these. I need quick recipes. So the way I would go about, I mean, and there's not that much to prep. You saw it's onions, leeks, and portobello mushrooms. That, that's pretty much all you have to chop. And everything else you can kind of get as you're going. You can open up the cans um, of tomato sauce or of diced tomatoes. You can get your nutritional yeast. You can measure out your spices. So it's really easy. Um, and so I think you're going to share this recipe in the, show notes. in the show notes, as well as any social media links or website or anything you tell yeah. us, will be right below the video. That a lot of people Perfect. can hear the, the show notes. Yeah, yeah. The recipe is also up on my website as well, with a printable version. If anybody is looking for well, it, well, we, so, we yeah. can link to that. And guys, show notes means under the YouTube video, if yeah. you're on Facebook and Twitter, you don't see show notes. That's why we. I know it's great. YouTube. It's great. And they yeah. say they can't see it because they have to click this little more button, you know, like it doesn't show immediately. Got to click this four letter word more and then the whole thing, 5,000 it... characters, boom, show up. And there's so much good stuff in show notes. There's so much important information, important links. Um, also on my website, there's uh, four other recipes from Plant Based Delicious. These are sample recipes that I've been sharing to help promote the book so people can check out more there as well. And I'm not sure when this is airing, when this episode is airing. Um, it might be after the release date, but if people order the book before June 13th, I'm not sure when this is going to be released, but if they order the book before Ju June 13th, they get um, a bonus e-cookbook as an incentive to order it while it's still in the pre-order phase. Wow. Fantastic. Well, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm so glad that we got this time to get together and thank you so much for accommodating me to your early morning, my evening. And I'm used to that, but I, I know that you're an early bird, right? You like to get up early. I do in the like morning. to get up early because I, I don't like that saying catching the worm, but I, I like it. I think I get, I'm more productive. My brain is better in the morning. I am as well. Absolutely. I, would, I look, I look better in the evening, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. You look wonderful. <laughs> thank you. So do you, Michelle. I mean, Ashley. All right. Well, th thank you so much. You want to hold up the book one more time and tell people where sure. on media to follow you. Yeah. So this is my new book, Plant Based Delicious. And you can find more out about the book on riseshinecook.ca. Um, and my handles on all social media are riseshinecook as well. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Ashley. Thank you so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. The information I'm getting in the book is right below this video. And please come back tomorrow for another fabulous show. Thanks, everyone.